Do you want to learn more about insects? Then you have come to the right place, my dear. Today, I, Bart Coppens, YouTuber and proud entomologist, presents you a new presentation in my brand new web series in which I educate you the biology of insects. In this episode, I'm going to teach you the general biology of insects and what makes them unique. Insects have been the central theme of my YouTube channel and my life in general. And despite posting educational content about them for a long time, I've never really taken the time to explain all the basics. So please, biology students of the world, entomology students, naturalists, enthusiasts, or just curious people on YouTube that want to learn something. Let's unite today and learn something together. This is Bart Coppens presenting the biology of insects. This episode is just the introduction. And in this episode, I will tell you what entomology is, why you should care about insects and why they are important, and what insects are in the first place. This episode can be considered as a warming up and is probably the most simple one, but also the most important one. Before we truly and deeply immerse ourselves into biology, we must reflect upon ourselves and begin with the very simple question. What is an insect? Most of you probably already have a good idea of what an insect is. But let's start from the very beginning, from the very basics, so that we can build our knowledge from our, the foundations. So first, I'll briefly explain to you what insects are. Insects are a type of invertebrate. Invertebrates are a type of animal that typically lack a backbone or a spine. They are a very diverse group that interestingly do not have an official taxonomical classification. Invertebrates account for a whopping 95% of all animal species, according to modern estimations. Over 1.3 million have already been described to science and they occupy virtually every viable habitat on Earth. Well-known examples of invertebrates are arthropods, such as insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and myriapods. Mollusks, chitons, snails, bivalves, squids, and octopuses. Annelids, such as earthworms and leeches, and cnidarians, hydras, jellyfishes, sea anemones, and corals are all invertebrates. But wait, Bart, wasn't this episode about insects and not invertebrates? Hold up, we are getting there. In order to identify what insects actually are, we have to boil it down to a single classification that we can agree upon. And stressing that insects are indeed a type of invertebrate, it is important to remember for later on. Insects are arthropods. Arthropods, as mentioned previously, are one of the many types of invertebrates. You could call them an arthropod invertebrate. Now this group has some very interesting traits that will seem familiar to those who study insects. So what, what exactly is an arthropod? As I mentioned before, arthropods are a type of invertebrate and invertebrates are animals that typically lack a backbone. However, unlike invertebrates in general, arthropods actually have a scientific and taxonomic classification. We are talking about the phylum Arthropoda. Insects are not the only type of arthropods, however. The best way of explaining what arthropods actually are is showing you this picture right here. This picture is not a complete scientific representation. Instead, it aims to simplify arthropods by giving you examples of the most famous and recognizable groups. As you can see, it doesn't only include insects. Arthropoda is divided into several groups. We can refer to those as subphyla. 
As you can see, Miriapoda contains centipedes and millipedes. Gelicerata contains spiders, scorpions, mites and ticks. Crustacea contain the crustaceans, such as for example crabs and shrimp, but also barnacles, for example, are also crustaceans. And then finally it contains the hexapoda subphylum, which contains the insects, but curiously also springtails. So what makes arthropods unique exactly? This image is very important because it illustrates one of the most unique and recognizable traits of arthropods. You see, arthropods have segmented bodies that are composed of segments that are recognizable and despite the fact that morphological variations exist, are also homologous to those of other arthropod species to a great extent. For example, this picture illustrates the anatomical composition of an arachnid, a spider that is. But on the top right, in green, we see the leg of a fly. Notice how the coxa, the trochanter, the femur, the tibia and the tarsus are present in both arthropods. Despite them belonging to different groups. Although the spider leg, for example, seems to have a metatarsus and a patella, that is lacking in the insect leg, it becomes clear that the segmented bodies of arthropods have significant commonalities. So the most important thing for you to remember right now is that the unique trait of arthropods are these segmented bodies. In fact, the word arthropod comes from the Greek word arthron, joint, and pose or foot. This more or less translates to joint leg or joint foot, a direct reference to their jointed bodies. Arthropods are cold-blooded, or using a more scientific definition, ectothermic. Ectotherms, as opposed to endotherms, are organisms that require external warmth in order to regulate their body temperatures, and thus Arthropods strongly rely on the environmental temperatures in order to regulate their body temperature. Since they hardly produce any body heat themselves, arthropods typically navigate through the environment in ways that maintains their body temperature. For example, moving between basking in the sun to their cooler burrows in order to warm up or cool down. Perhaps this also explains why arthropod biodiversity is higher in warmer places such as the tropics, since the tropical warmth makes it easier to regulate their body temperatures. As mentioned before, arthropods are a type of invertebrate, which are animals that lack a spine. Instead, arthropods support their body weight in a different way. They have exoskeletons. In short, the body of arthropods is covered with tough armor that protects them. These exoskeletons are composed of chitin, which is a modified polysaccharide. Chitin is a type of carbohydrate that has a basic structure of a repeating chain of sugar molecules. The exoskeleton is what protects arthropods from injuries and harm, since it gives them a tough exterior in some cases. It also helps their thermoregulation and can pro protect them from other threats such as desiccation or drying out. However, such an exoskeleton, while offering advantages, also has drawbacks. For example, exoskeletons are not very flexible. They can't really stretch or grow. This is why arthropods have to shed their skins when they grow bigger and their growth is limited by the exoskeleton, and instead they have to de develop a bigger exoskeleton in order to grow bigger. But what about insects? Finally, it seems that after all this time, we have arrived at the creatures we are truly going to discuss today, the insects. Insects are a class of arthropods, class insecta, under the phylum arthropoda. The word insects, come from the Latin word insectum, meaning with a notched or divided body, or literally cut into, 
from the neuter singular perfect passive principle of insectare, which means to cut into or to cut up, or from into, into and secare to cut. Basically, it refers to their cut up jointed bodies. What makes insects different from other arthropods is their anatomy. For instance, insects have six legs. And secondly, their body is divided into three parts. The head, the thorax and the abdomen. This is much different from other arthropods such as arachnids, where there is no distinct thorax and head and where they are more or less fused together in what is called the cephalothorax. Insects also have two antennae. And last but not least, they can have wings. Insects are the only arthropods that can possess wings. This summarization of their body plan is the easiest way to single out insects and separate them from other arthropods. The orders, families and species of insects are mind-blowingly diverse. Insects are the most diverse group of animals on our planet, coming in many shapes, forms, colors and filling, filling many niches. However, six legs, two antennae, a head, a thorax and an abdomen and potentially wings remains a universal way to recognize them. This is ultimately the basic body plan of almost any insect. So, to summarize, insects are ectothermic or cold-blooded, have segmented bodies and legs, have exoskeletons made of chitin, have six legs, an abdomen, a thorax, and are potentially winged. Insects are a class insecta of arthropods. Insects are the largest and most diverse group of organisms on Earth. In this pie chart you can see a breakdown of all the species that have currently been described to science. And insects absolutely dominated, being over 53% of all the currently described species. Now there are approximately 30 orders with the numbers of described species reaching nearly 1 million. Now, if we purely look at animals and not plants or other microorganisms, these phenomenal creatures constitute about 75% of all described animal species and are incredibly abundant and yet abundantly overlooked. Insects are found on land, in water and in the air and nearly all habitats on all continents, including Antarctica. Insects are the biggest and most important group of animals that the environment relies on. Now our definitions of what insects are have aligned and the basics have been covered. We can start our real entomology class. Are you ready to become more educated today? Welcome to episode number one of Bug School. Bug School is my long-awaited YouTube series in which I educate you about the science of entomology. And that is insects and anything that pertains to their biology. In this episode of Bug School, we will start with a very general introduction into entomology, an introduction into the biology of insects, what they are, what makes them tick, but also, what is entomology and why is it important? This is going to be our most simple episode and as this web series carries on, it will become more and more complicated. But we will start with an introduction to this field of science. I will try to make many more episodes of Bug School after this one. Is there any subject that you would like to see? Let me know in the comments. Making this episode takes a lot of hard work and dedication, but I am open to suggestions. This presentation uses copyrighted photos and illustrations, which I am allowed to do under the fair use law, 
which allows me to use these images in a transformative and educational way. This video is demonetized and I gain nothing from this. And for non-commercial purposes, the fair use law allows me to use these materials in a transformative way. Are you the photographer or creator of one of the pictures that I used in this transformation, uh, in this presentation? Then please understand that I'm allowed to use your images for transformative and educational purposes. This episode is called the Introduction to Insects and Entomology. This episode will be a part of a very long series in which we will explain to you everything there is to know about insects, their evolution, their ecology, their life histories, their populations and more. But it is impossible for me to lecture you, my students, on a subject that you are not familiar with. And in order to understand my lectures about entomology, you also need to understand the basics of insects and the field of entomology. So I'm going to treat you as totally ignorant and we will work our way up the ladder together up to college level entomology in this web series. What is entomology? Simply put, entomology is the study of insects. However, summarizing this simply may not do it justice. Entomology is much diverse and pertains to the study of insects and their relationships to humans, the environment and other organisms. This includes a very broad spectrum of, spectrum of biology, including but not limited to molecular genetics, behavior, biomechanics, biochemistry, systematic, systematics, physiology, and developmental biology, ecology, morphology, and even paleontology. I guess that you could say that almost any kind of science can be called entomology under the right circumstances. Sometimes even physics, when we are talking about the polarization of light and structural coloration that gives butterflies their shiny wings or to moths when we are extrapolating data to draw conclusions about insects, to chemistry when it comes to the defensive compounds and chemical ecology of insects, as long as insects are at the center of all of this. Entomology has many layers. It's a common misconception that entomology is the same as academics. Anybody that works with insects professionally or educates people about insects professionally or researches insects professionally can be considered an entomologist, regardless of any academic background. In fact, a very large part of the field of entomology, be it the collectors who collect specimens and perform taxonomical research, to something as simple as writing a book or a field guide about insects, or even me and my YouTube channel and this presentation that you are watching is done by amateurs who are in each and every regard considered to be an entomologist as long as they imp uh, meet the important criteria of contributing to knowledge. Simply put, anyone who in any way or shape or form contributes to our collective knowledge of insects be it through new discoveries or simply through education, is considered to be an entomologist. If you have ever discovered anything new about insects or have done work to educate people about insects, then you too are an entomologist. Of course, academically, entomology is a branch of zoology, although due to their close relationships with plants and agricultural crops, some universities also place it under plant sciences. Entomology, or the study of insects, is a field of study that is much older than most people can imagine. Here on the left, we see an interesting image. The natural history, or in Latin, Naturalis Historia, is a work by Pliny the Elder. It is one of the largest single works to have survived from the Roman Empire to the modern day and purports to cover all ancient knowledge. The work is divided into 37 books, organized into 10 volumes. These topics 
include astronomy, mathematics, geography, ethnography, anthropology, human physiology, zoology, botany, agriculture, horticulture, pharmacology, mining, mineralogy, sculpture, art and precious stones. But most importantly, it also contains some entomology. The natural philosopher Pliny the Elder wrote a book on the kinds of insects. These books were allegedly written around the year 77 Anno Domini. The year 77, or in other words, about 1942 years ago, as of the day that I am giving this presentation, over 90 centuries ago. In these books, Pliny correctly identifies the origin of amber as the fossilized resin of pine trees, for example, stating the fact that insects are often encapsulated in them as evidence and has observations about the importance of the queen bee and correctly observes that insects do respirate and more. I guess you could say that the very beginnings of entomology date as far back as ancient Greece. I am bold enough to state that they date even further, but that perhaps no written records of it have yet survived. From that time, numerous works survived, even from Islamic scholars, who somewhere around the year 800 published a book about flies. Or to the ancient Chinese imperial Song dynasty about a thousand years ago, the works of someone called Shen Ko described the role of predatory insects in protecting crops from insect pests. Now I'm careful with gatekeeping the word science, Certainly, all this research from ancient times is considered science. Although they lack the resources and modern insights, to classify it as modern science of entomology in the shape and form it has taken today. It is not until the 16th and 17th century that the modern science of entomology actually begins to take shape. In this time, we begin to see paintings and illustrations of insects and their life histories cropping up. People began to collect natural curiosities as status symbols, which also drove the curiosity when it comes to nature. But also other influences such as the development of accurate magnifying glasses and later microscopes accelerated these studies. The basic anatomies and life histories of insects started being described in detail. In the 18th century, entomology starts flourishing. Illustrative works were also popular, showy insects, often beautifully colored, whose purpose was also somewhat sensual. An example provided is Maria Sibylla Merian's Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensis from the year 1705. Maria Sibylla Merian is a notable figure because, in general, only men received royal uh, or government funding in order to travel in the colonies to find new species of plants and animals to make collections and work there or settle. Scientific expeditions at this period of time were not very common and Merian's self-funded expeditions raised many eyebrows. She, she uh, however, succeeded in discovering a whole range of previously unknown insects and plants in the interior of the country of Suriname, including the life history of many insects. She was one of the first and prominent female entomologists that pursued her interests regardless of any judgment for being a woman. Later, the 10th edition of the Systema Naturae, which is a book written by the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus, 
and published in two volumes in 1758, which would change the way we study and classify organisms forever. In this work, the binomial system was finally settled upon, allowing for a totally new field of study, which is the classification of organisms, otherwise known as taxonomy, making it more convenient to describe new species and study biodiversity overall. It is always the progress in other fields of science that accommodates progress in related fields like entomology. In the middle we see William Kirby, who in London in 1833 founded the Royal Entomolo Entomological Society. And in 1885, Queen Victoria herself granted the society its royal ch uh, charter character. The society's patron is Her Majesty the Queen herself. It's no surprise that butterflies, like Queen Victoria's Birdwing or Ornithoptera Victoria, were named after her, for example. When I was growing up, I was always treated as special for my interest in insects. Because let's face it, the interest is obscure. However, I would be a fool to claim it was unique to my own self. The human fascination for insects dates back to very ancient times. From the very ancient Egypt, the solar deity Kefri had the face of a dung beetle and scarab beetles were of religious significance. To the painter such as Van Gogh, the famous Dutch painter who made an artwork featuring a moth. Or how about the painting a dragonfly, two moths, a spider and some beetles with wild strawberries by Jan van Kessel from the 17th century. The real question is, are these things entomology? Well, they are not strictly entomology, but I do think that there is evidence that humans have been interested in a natural world and their surroundings since the very beginning of time. If not in art, Culture or science, all of these stemming from the same in inherent curiosity that humans have always had. Of course, this pertains to any type of plants and animals. It's no surprise even the most ancient cave paintings and petroglyphs often depicted animals or plants. Humans have always had a predisposition to be curious towards the natural world. And insects are not an exception. I don't think entomology is a recent development. Although the modern tools we have and the fact that we are not constantly preoccupied with survival and have more time to spend to satisfy our curiosity, I wouldn't be surprised if insects have fascinated humans since the beginning of time. Nowadays, with modern entomology, it looks radically different. With modern tools, the landscape of biology has changed enormously modern agriculture has taken over the world. And with that, pest control, or being able to repel or modify pest organisms in commercial crops, is one of the most well-funded and important fields of entomology. The other major change is our understanding of DNA. With the genetic code of organisms being available to us, which nowadays can even be modified, rearranged or barcoded, the field of entomology is much more tightly intertwined with molecular science and organic chemistry. With each and every development to our understanding of life as a whole, comes new ways to study organisms like insects. The field appears to be ever-changing. Interestingly, despite entomology being so important nowadays to agriculture, but also the control of vector diseases such as malaria and thousands of professional entomologists making careers in the field, it does seem that the attitude has changed. Entomology has become very practical, while funding for researching economically important organisms has increased. It does seem that the sector pertaining to organisms that are less important to the economy has diminished. Despite that, with climate change and the conservation of species becoming increasingly important themes in our life, one can hope to expect a change. Why should you care about insects? Why should you care about entomology? 
For most people, unfortunately, insects are just annoying little creatures that harass you, contaminate your food or make you sick. This is very misguided. Insects are, dare I say, some of the most important animals on our planet and they are crucial to our continued existence. Our ignorance about this group of animals in modern age and society, with climate and sustainability being so important right now, is jarring. So time for me to introduce you to why you should study and why you should care about insects in the first place. Ah, oh, what a nice selection of plants and animals. Look at that. Hedgehogs, chameleons, anteaters, bee-eaters, Venus flytraps, frogs, bats. Lovely to look at. But I selected these for a reason. You see, all of these species have something in common. C can you guess what it is? No? I'll give you five seconds to figure it out. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, time's up. I'll tell you what these species have in common. They are insectivores. That's right. By now, something should dawn upon you. Have you ever realized the massive amount of animals and plants that are entirely dependent on insects? From frogs to lizards to birds to shrews to blackbirds and tits to bee eaters and ant eaters to bats to hedgehogs to sparrows and swallows. Have you ever taken a moment to realize the enormous amount of species on planet Earth that depend on insects for their survival? This bird here on the left is a tit, or in particular a Eurasian blue tit. There are many species of tits in Europe, and all of them are fond of caterpillars. Unfortunately since then, their populations have been declining. The reasons are numerous, from habitat loss to the widespread use of pesticides. But scientists found something astounding. Biologists have now shown conclusively that in urban uh, blue tits, reduced breeding success is linked to poor nestling diet, and in particular Larry, the scarcity of caterpillars, which is their preferred nestling food. The researchers counted caterpillars, other insects and spiders on the trees where blue tits forage. They found that caterpillars were greatly reduced in the city and did not show the typical seasonal peak on which the th chicks can thrive. This happens, as it turns out, due to climate change. You see, in spring, when the sun warms up the countryside in Europe, caterpillars start hatching from their hibernating eggs. Specifically, their favorite are winter moths such as the Ophoptera brumata or Eranus defoliaria, two types of moths that typically spawn thousands of caterpillars in spring. The caterpillars of these moths are strongly seasonal and their occurrence is linked to warmer temperatures in spring that wake them up from their hibernation. The blue tit, as it turns out, is perfectly adapted to this. These magnificent birds know precisely when the caterpillars are available in spring and they start building their nests exactly when the caterpillars are the most abundant. The birds catch these caterpillars in great numbers to feed their little, little nestlings. However, because of climate change, Europe has gotten a lot warmer. And because of the changing climate, spring is warmer than it used to be as well. Everything happens early. The flowers bloom earlier, the bees and butterflies come earlier, and so do the caterpillars of winter moths. This is bad news for the blue tits because they are not able to adapt to this rapidly. Because the caterpillars are now two weeks earlier, the blue tits build their nest two weeks too late, when the peak supply of caterpillars is already diminishing. So to summarize these birds, count on these caterpillars to feed their babies. But due to a shift in climate, the caterpillars come too early and the chicks end up hungry and risk starvation. It's interesting how a slight two weeks shift in caterpillar season can have such a dramatic effect on one species of bird. 
But this presentation is not about blue tits. The blue tit was just an example of how dependent most animals are on insects. The success of insects is correlated with the success of many other species. A threat to insects means a threat to the entire ecosystem. Insects are what supports the entire terrestrial ecosystems. Less insects means less species of other animals and plants too. What about spiders, for example? Most of them exclusively feed on insects. And so do many birds, frogs and a lot more animals. When insects decline, the food web collapses and biodiversity is lost over the whole spectrum. This spells a disaster for nature and a disaster for humanity. But that is not all. Let me introduce you to the subject of trophic ecology. Trophic ecology has to do with feeding relations. For instance, weasels eat mice and mice eat herbs. And that is among the most basic organizing principles underlying biodiversity in natural ecosystems. Trophic ecology is a scientific discipline that investigates the structure of feeding relationships among organisms in an ecosystem. In general, each trophic level relates to the one below it by absorbing some of the energy it consumes and in this way can be regarded as resting on or supported by the next lower trophic level. Food chains can be diagrammed to illustrate the amount of energy that moves from one feeding level to the next in a food chain. This is called an energy pyramid. The energy transferred between levels can also be thought of as approximating to a transfer in biomass. So energy pyramids can be viewed as biomass pyramids, picturing the amount of biomass that results at a higher level from biomass consumed at a lower level. We can distinguish several levels. On level one, we have what are called the producers. Plants and algae make their own food and are called producers. On level 2, we can distinguish primary consumers. Herbivores eat plants and are called primary consumers. On level 3, we can distinguish secondary consumers. Carnivores that eat herbivores are called secondary consumers. And then on level 4, we find tertiary consumers. Carnivores that eat other carnivores are called tertiary consumers. And so forth. Typically, apex predators, by definition, have no predators of their own and are at the top. So in this case, the owl, which has been used as an example here, typically feeds on bigger prey, like mice, rats or sparrows. But these mice, rats and sparrows, in their turn, feed on insects, such as grasshoppers. And the grasshoppers feed on the producers and act as herbivores on the grass. So indirectly, the owl is dependent on insects. It has been estimated that approximately half of all living insects are herbivores. Some of the largest insect groups are almost exclusively plant feeders. Although insects are relatively small, they are so numerous in most terrestrial and freshwater environments that they do not only outnumber, but also outweigh all the other animals combined. Insects are also by far the largest source of food for animals that eat meat or flesh, both on the land and in fresh water. Insects are the most important primary consumers in terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems. Think about something such as a mighty eagle. It may catch prey such as waterfowl or pigeons or pheasants, that ultimately feed on insects themselves. So even something like an eagle or a big apex predator in the end relies on insects, even if they do not directly consume them. This is a good way to illustrate how uh, much of the food web is dependent on insects. And just like that, it starts to make sense. Insects are simply at the very bottom of the food chain and it's their presence alone that defines our very environment. 
From that point of view alone, it's safe to say that insects are not only the most diverse, but the most important animals on our planet. No matter what kind of animals or plants you prefer, the whole system is interconnected and tied to insects as one of the most fundamental pillars of the food chain and biodiversity overall. And for that alone, they deserve our utter and utmost attention. Hmm, a nice selection of vegetables and fruits. Do you have any particular favorite? Let me know in the comments. They are not only tasty, but they have one thing in common. Can you guess what it is that they all have in common? Well, here it is. All of these plants are pollinated by insects. Some scientists have estimated that out of every three bites of food that we eat, only exists because of animal pollinators like bees, butterflies and moths, beetles and other insects. Annually, 300 to 600 billion United States dollars worth of food crops is directly affected by pollinators. It's pretty safe to assume that without insects, a lot of our food would be off the menu. A world without insects means a world that would struggle to feed the global human population of 7 billion. Our supermarkets would have half the amount of fruit and vegetables that we do today. It would be pretty rude for us to assume that a lack of pollination would merely affect the vegetables that you can put in your curry. The evolutionary relationship between flowering angiosperm plants and pollinating insects is estimated to date back for about 110 to 140 million years. Out of 250,000 species um, of all plants, 88.7% is angiosperm plants and 90% of them are pollinated by insects like bees, beetles, moths and flies. So that means on a global scale about 80% of the plant species on our planet require the help of insects for their fertilization. It should go without saying that the plants themselves are the very foundations of life. They produce the very oxygen we breathe, the food that we eat, they retain the water we drink, they regulate our very environment and climate. The implication alone that 80% of all plant species is dependent on insects to some degree should give you an idea why insects are so vitally and crucially important for life on our planet and are tightly intertwined with what our planet even looks like. Unfortunately, insects do not only shape our world in positive ways. Meet one of the deadliest animals on our planet, the mosquito. Did you know that every year over a million people still die from malaria alone? Nearly 700 million people contact mosquito-borne illnesses each year causing more than 1 million deaths. Common type of mosquito-borne diseases include malaria, dengue, the West Nile virus, chikungunya, yellow fever and the Zika virus. The negative reputation that insects have is unfortunately not completely undeserved. As we have established before, insects are of crucial importance to the environment. They pollinate the majority of plants. They form vital links in the food web and without them it is safe to say ecosystems could completely collapse. And yet, despite the surface these animals appear to be uh, doing for our environment, many people tend to think of them negatively. Why is that? Well, let me ask you a question. How many people, when they notice a beetle, Think to themselves, wow, thank you, beetle, for reducing organic material in the soil. How many people, when they see a hoverfly, think to themselves, wow, thank you, hoverfly, for being a pollinator? How many people, when they spot a giant praying mantis, think to themselves, wow, thank you, praying mantis, for eating harmful mosquitoes, flies and grasshoppers to keep the population down? The answer, well, probably less than 1% of all people. Instead, the insects that we tend to notice in our daily lives are the ones who are invading our homes. 
and can make our lives more difficult. Mosquitoes, lice, fleas, locusts, cockroaches, but even things like caterpillars feeding on our vegetables. We only tend to notice them when they are an inconvenience. So I would say it's a case of selective memory. That being said, yes, a number of insects do make our lives more difficult, such as the aforementioned malaria mosquitoes. Pest insects are the type of insects that make our lives more difficult. One common example are higher herbivores that feed on plants, and in particular our food crops. Some insects have the ability to harm our food crops, and therefore our food production. Every year, insects cause major losses in food production. The average annual loss was estimated to be 7.7% uh, of total crop production. The total, the total annual economic losses caused by insects uh, reach about 70.7 uh, billion US dollars. Insect pests have a significant effect on crop yields and quality. But there are not uh, just agricultural pests, household pests can also interfere with our very homes. Termites, for example, can cause major damage to a building. Each year, termites and similar pests cause an estimated $30 billion in damage to crops and man-made structures in the USA. Homeowners who discover termite damage will spend an average of $3,000 to repair the damage. This is just the United States as an example, so the number is expected to be higher worldwide. Or what about cockroaches and houseflies? Species that, as fascinating as they are, have the tendency to crawl through our sewers, crawl through excrement and trash and then enjoy walking over our foods, contaminating them and potentially making us sick. Keep your friends close but keep your enemies closer. Knowledge of insects and their biology does not only allow us to conserve and protect them, it also, also gives us the ability to control them. Insect pest management and pest control are in fact one of the major branches of entomology today. With modern agriculture being so widespread and large scale, there is a growing demand for ways to control pests that damage our crops. And entomologists are burdened to find a solution. Entomology can save lives. As over a million people year per year die from diseases like malaria, yellow fever, sleeping sickness and other insect transmitted disease, quite literally entomology has the potential to save millions of lives. It is our thorough understanding of insects and their ecology that provides us with solutions. For example, there are ways we can use their natural predators and diseases against them or exploit their hormones and receptors to make specific pesticides that target them. Our understanding of insects goes beyond appreciation of them alone. It can save lives by preventing the disease transmission and it can prevent people from going hungry. In developing nations, insects are one of the major factors that are hindering food production. In Brazil, for example, insect pests have caused annual losses of $12 billion to the Brazilian economy, of which approximately 1.6 billion are because of exotic and introduced pest pieces. In the past, however, our widespread use of harmful pesticides to control insects has been devastating. Over 1 billion pounds of pesticides are used in the United States each year, and approximately 5.6 billion pounds are used worldwide. In many developing countries, programs to control exposures are limited or non-existent. Pesticides can cause short-term but also long-term health effects. Pesticides have been implied in human studies of leukemia, lymphoma and cancers of the brain, breast, prostate, testes and ovaries. Rep reproductive harm from pesticides includes birth defects, stillbirth, spontaneous abortion, sterility and infertility. 
Not only that, pesticides have been linked to one of the major reasons for the decline of biodiversity on all trophic levels. And lately, scientists have been looking for alternative solutions. A newly emerging trend, for example, is biological control. Biological control is the act of controlling pests such as insects, mites, weeds and plant diseases among other, uh, by using other organisms. A lot of pest organisms have enemies of their own. These could be parasites, natural predators or diseases. In a lot of cases, insects have been used to combat other insects. By researching and cultivating their natural enemies, pest insects can be controlled. And guess who are burdened with this task? Entomologists. Entomology can provide us with more sustainable and less harmful solutions to destructive pesticides by researching pest insects and ways to control them. And what about products made from insects themselves? One famous example is honey which is used in a large number of products. Or what about silk? Silk farming and the silk industry clothes people and provides them with an income. You may not be aware of this depending on where you live, but in many parts of the world, insects are also raised as food. Entomophagy, the consumption of insects, is commonplace and also a very sustainable way to produce animal proteins. You may not realize that insects feed and clothe people on a daily basis. Yes, it's true, it may seem ridiculous, but if you've never thought about it, insects are critical for your survival, my survival and the survival for society as a whole. Insects influence us and our planet in so many ways and without them there would be not much left for humanity. Insects sustain the very ecosystems we rely on to survive and shape the planet as a whole. And that is why you, my friend, should learn about them as well. Are you convinced? Good. This was just a warming up. In this presentation, I have briefly introduced you to the fundamental biology of insects, their importance and the science of entomology as a whole. And ultimately, why should you or anyone care about them in the first place? But we are only just getting started. This is the first episode of my online entomology course that will explain the biology of these animals in detail. Now that you have been convinced of their importance, naturally you will agree to study together with me and begin to see the vital importance of the knowledge I am about to share with you. It is only our next episode that the real entomology begins. This was episode number one, an introduction to insects and entomology. With this presentation, you should understand the basics of entomology and why it's more important than you imagine. In our next episode, the real science begins. This is a long running series and with each episode, the level of biology will become a little bit higher. Together, I will take you on a journey back in time and discuss in detail one of the greatest wonders of life, the evolution of insects. The next episode can be found in the playlist on my channel in the links below in the end screen and more. This was your online entomologist Bart Coppens. I believe knowledge should be free to those who cannot afford it. Books and college courses are expensive. Unfortunately, we live in a capitalist world. Here is a gentle reminder that my channel is entirely demonetized by YouTube and not supported by YouTube. This education depends on crowdfunding for 100%. If you like the show and you would like to see it continue, please consider donating to me through Patreon, PayPal, Ko-Fi and many other ways provided in the description and links. And in return, I will share my brain with you and take you on a journey through the wondrous world of insects. The beauty of crowdfunding is that everybody profits. And I understand not everybody is able to pay for educational content, especially in times that are economically difficult. But those who can afford it and are willing and able will give me the free time that I need to study and write this online course. This benefits not only me and you, but also thousands of other people who will enjoy this content for free and benefit from the knowledge. 
Thank you for watching the first episode of my entomology course. I hope to see you in the next episode. Bye bye.